All right, folks. Well, you know, thank you for, for joining us this evening. And uh, I want to uh, just uh, say I uh, appreciate the Norberteen community appreciates you coming out for, for this, this lecture. Um, it is going to be the first of three lectures and with a con concluding symposium on Catholic education uh, and really the question of in this particular moment, you know, it, in this particular context, where Catholic education is going to is going to go, you know, the the demand for Catholic education at a time when we have indeed many conversations about, in general, the future of education uh, in this country, really throughout the world, um, that where Catholic education fits in into that larger, you know, uh, spectrum of, of discourse. I think perhaps now more than ever, as there are so many debates about ed education in the United States, you know, it is it is of a moment now, maybe more than ever before, um, you know, to have this conversation. And so, we are having uh, three different uh, panelists that will be presenting. And the, the first uh, lecture, the lecture that we will be showcasing this evening, will feature uh, Ms. Donna Illibrand, who is the superintendent of Catholic schools within uh, the Archdiocese here uh, in New Mexico. And uh, so she's gonna be talking uh, through uh, her experience and the, the optic that she has working uh, with, uh, I believe, primary and secondary ed in the archdiocese. Uh, and, you know, thinking about education writ large, you know, thinking about how Catholic education compares with, with public education at this, this point in time. And really, you know, perhaps what Catholic education offers and, and the, the relevance, really the valence of Catholic education now uh, at a time when there were so many, uh, you know, debates and, and in some cases, you know, some fairly vocal conflicts about really what education is for, you know, in civic society and, and you know, how it, it should be implemented. And so uh, without any further ado, uh, I will present uh, Ms. Donna Illibrand, uh Superintendent of Catholic Schools, and, uh, and she will uh, enlighten us with, I'm sure, an enormous amount of <clears throat> wisdom and experience, you know, about Catholic education and why it indeed is relevant at this time in the 21st century. So it's all yours, the floor, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and to share my insight with you on my perspective of Catholic education. Just a little bit about myself. Um, my dad was military, so we lived all over the world. And then I went to college and met my husband, and he joined the military. And again, we went all over the world. So I've seen education in many different formats. I've seen it in Europe. I've seen it on the East Coast, the West Coast, the Midwest, the South, the Southwest, the Southeast. Trust me, I, I've seen education private and public schools. And you know, when we started having kids, we decided we are Catholic, that we will do what we could, whatever we could do to send our children to Catholic schools. In fact, when we, our two oldest ones were just, we had just come back from four years in Germany, we moved to Ohio. Um, I was still unemployed because we moved in the middle of the year and you know, it's every time is a new start. So I was cleaning houses in order to afford to send my children to Catholic school. And it, I was it was worth every every moment. I did not mind because this was my calling at the time as a parent. I wanted to do what was best, what was safe, and what I felt was God's call to service for me and for my children to attend a Catholic school to get an education where they learn about God. But not only that, they they see purpose. They see God's love. They have a reason to get out of the bed because they're excited to go to school. It was it was very uh, unique, but um, the reason for Catholic schools vary from person to person. And here in the United States, Catholic schools were started by our religious that came over and started in St. Augustine in Florida was one of the first Catholic schools in the United States. And then as our Americans started moving west, so did the schools. Our first public schools in the United States were all Catholic because it was through our faith, through our, our trust in God that we need to educate our children to prepare them for the future, to give them the knowledge, the love, 
the authenticity that they need to care and to serve because that's how we are called as Christians to serve one another. So why Catholic education? There are many, many reasons. And today I would like to share many of those with you. So let's see if this is not going to work, of course. So faith, hope, and love. And then we hear about that. It's from Corinthians. When we have faith, faith in God, faith that we know that there is a tomorrow, faith that we know that we are never alone, faith that we know that God will carry us through our hard times. And no matter what the struggle, he is with us. And so faith and hope, hope during, hope got us through COVID, COVID-19. You know, our kids, for example, during COVID, they, we were shut down in New Mexico, March 13th, I remember that day well, and we thought it was for two weeks. We had a big line, we, the kids came in, they got their Chromebooks, they got their books, they were online the next week. Two weeks turned into the rest of the school year through the end of May. Our expectations were that every day they would get out of bed, log into their Chromebooks, and our teachers would do the same and teach. Our teachers were teaching every day, all subjects, and accountability because they knew and they had hope that this would end and someday we would have to move forward. We even had PE online and the kids would do jumping jacks and push-ups and all of that online. They would learn songs. They were instructed in art, in Spanish. I mean, everything, including the math and science and social studies, reading, phonics on our little guys. It worked. And our schools here in the diocese showed one to two years growth during COVID. Our other schools did not. Many of them went backwards one to two years. But that's because we had hope and the love of Christ in our heart, knowing that tomorrow is another day and we are not getting up. And so that did play a role. And knowing that God is with us at all times, through pandemics, through wars, through poverty, through illness, God is always with us. But not only that, we have to give our children a purpose. Now, I was a middle school teacher for many years, and I used to joke. I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up, but I know God has a purpose for me. And I would explain to them, we're all on a path, and our path is what? To get to heaven. Our job in Catholic schools is to save souls. So, and by doing that, we have to give them a purpose and to know you can veer off that path, as many of us do, but you can always get back on. And we have the tools and the ability to do that. We have the sacrament of confession that we can go to reconciliation. Oh, dear Lord, I messed up again, or I've been gossiping. Please give me the strength to do better. We go to mass together to pray for each other. And that is when you have faith that God is with us and there is a purpose. So we have to get out of bed in the morning to fill, fulfill that need. What is our purpose? Is my purpose to teach? Is it to evangelize? Is it to, to help the poor on the streets, to, to help the homeless? Um, I love doing all of the above. You know, I, I went to Calcutta and served in the same with the Sisters of Charity in India. It was amazing. It was touching. It was a, a, a lifelong dream of mine to go. And it was amazing. And God has a plan. But if we are not there constantly serving one another, if I were to bully you in class, which is not acceptable at all, you're preventing that child from becoming the purpose or the person that God wants you to become. And that's how we teach our children. You can't be mean. When you're mean, you're making that other person sad. You are preventing them from becoming the person God wants them to be. What if that was the person that found the cure to cancer, but yet because you were mean and, and hurt that child, we'll never have that cure. Your grandmother won't survive it. 
And so a little bit of Catholic guilt goes a long way. <laughs> and we use God in our discipline. You know, I may not have seen what happened, but God did. So if you're going to tell me you didn't do it, I'm going to believe you. But God knows the truth. And how can we do better? And then next time, what will we do better? What can you do differently? And that's having hope and knowing that God is with us and telling every child, why do we need to know algebra? Well, guess what? Algebra is a way of solving problems. We need to know algebra because you need to solve problems. You're not going to have a problem-free life. And, you know, we... When we lived in Florida, our roof went off and we had to put a new roof and do a bunch of remodeling. And our roofer didn't know algebra and didn't know how to solve. I said, okay, so 20% of our roof is gone. How much do we owe? And it's like, well, I don't know. I said, well, you have to solve for X. If you know that 20% of this is X, you need, and I had to show him how to do it. And he's like, oh, that's why I need to know algebra. It's simple little things in life. How do you balance a checkbook? If you know what a checkbook is. But anyways, life skills. There's a reason why we need to know civics. There's a reason why we need to know history. We don't want to keep repeating history. And you read the Bible and it's repeated over and over again. Here we are. Today's reading. What is it? The harvest is plenty. The laborers few. That is the world we're living in right now. There's so much work to be done, but no one wants to do it. What are we teaching our children then? In our Catholic schools, we are teaching you are called to serve. You have an ethical obligation in life to find out what your God-given talent is. What are your skills that you have? If they've never had music or art or Spanish, maybe they never knew that they're an artist or a musician. And we need to provide them with opportunities to become the person that God wants them to become. We don't know who that is. We don't know what that looks like. Every day is a new day, but every day God is with us. He never gives up. And I tell the children, God loves you. So you messed up. It's okay. Look at our saints. They weren't perfect. They made mistakes, but they saw the mistakes and they turned their life around with God's help. That's so powerful. And that's why Catholic education is important because we are teaching them the faith. And the faith is that you are love, that God loves you, and you need to be that light of Christ to those around you to bring them to Christ so that they can see there is a better way. I look at the children. I see even an 80 year old, I see the, ch the child in them. And I see our children under the bridge. Do you think that child said, when I grow up, I wanna live under the bridge? When I grow up, I'm gonna lose my family and be addicted? No, they lost their way. They lost their purpose. And more importantly, they lost faith and hope. And that's why faith and hope and purpose is so important. And that is something that we teach in our schools, not only to our children, but often we try to teach it to our parents if they are open to hear the word of God. But we have to be, you know, the role models in life. And so God has a plan for us. And we want the, ch the children in our schools, we want all children to know that they are loved, that they are a child of God. Every human being is a child of God. And we have to show that compassion and respect to all children. Now, here in New Mexico, just so you know, this is uh, the US and New Mexico as well, as far as Catholic schools go. In the United States, we have almost 6,000 Catholic schools. Um, the majority of them are secondary, or I'm sorry, elementary, and then you have 1,174 that are secondary, which is high school. Students, over 1.5 million students in the elementary and middle school, 1.1 in the secondary. Well, I'm sorry, altogether it's 1.693. No. 493 students uh, all together in the United States in our schools. 
And then we have 147,849 professional staff, that's teachers and admin. This is how they perform, public versus Catholic, and I'm not here to slam public, but this is our scores for math and for reading. 38% of our public schools are at the uh, their performance, only 38 are proficient, whereas 61%, we rank 61 here. So, I mean, there's a lot of different data on here. This is the state of New Mexico. In New Mexico, we have three dioceses. We have Las Cruces, Gallup, and the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. In those schools total, 27 total, 26 of them are elementary, and one, which is St. Pius here in Albuquerque, is a secondary high school. We have nearly 4,000 students in our archdiocese, and these are, these are last year's data. And our elementary, uh, 3,503, and secondary, 489. Now, um, our secondary has gone up. Our elementary has gone down just a little bit, 4% this year in the state of New Mexico. How do we fund Catholic education? So this, this is important because Catholic education is funded through tuition. So we charge tuition so that we can pay salaries, electricity, property tax, insurance, everything else. And but, salary, but tuition alone does not fund it. So the average cost here, the average <laughs> tuition is about $5,500 a student per year in a Catholic school, which if you're on the 10 month plan is $550 a month. Preschool alone in the secular world is over $1,000 a month and it's just daycare. In our schools, it's still $550 a month and they're learning. It's all day. They're learning math, phonics, social studies, science. They're doing hands-on activities, art. They have all the specials. It's amazing what they're learning for such a low cost. It may seem high when you look at that, but the reality of it is over, if you look, we, we looked at this earlier this year, over 50% of our tax revenues in New Mexico go towards education. And if you divide that out, that's $30,000 per student. Mm. So one of the things that we hear, we hear people say, well, you just take the best, the cream of the crop. That is wrong. We take all children if we can meet their needs. Now, there are, we have autistic kids. We have Down syndrome kids. We have hearing impaired, uh, of course, ADHD, uh, dyslexic children in, in our schools. If we can meet their needs, we will take them if we we don't have $30,000 a student to pay special ed teachers, to spend, to pay for one-on-one -on -one help. If we had the money, we would do it for sure. It's, and yet look at what we're doing. I mean, look at the difference, 30,000, 5,500. Hmm. And yet look at the outcomes. So this is from last year's reports because they're just coming, just started school. So the average score, and this is for the nation. Look at this, down. It is down 13% this year, over 13% in math. Look at how the trend has been since, two, since the year 2000. It's been mapped. We have the nation's report card, which is NAEP, that shows this. That's math. Again, down 14% in reading. That's not acceptable. These kids are just as smart as any other child. Sorry, it's a little blurry, but this is a percentage of students at proficiency in New Mexico. Reading proficiency, only 35% of the students in our public schools are on grade level for reading. For math, only 24% proficiency in math. And in early literacy, which is usually pre-K, kinder, that's pre-reading, 31% in our public schools. And the graduation rate, 75%. That's up from what it was in the past. In our schools, it's 99% graduation rate. Again, why are we settling for this? 
we keep putting more and more and more money. We are one of the top spenders on money public ed for public education, and yet we're 50th in the nation for education. In my mind, that is not acceptable. There has to be a better way. 50th percent nationwide, no wonder our kids are dropping out. No wonder they don't have hope because they never learned. I mean, could you imagine if you're coming out of school and you can't read a contract, you're buying a car or you're renting a house and they're taking advantage of you and you don't even know it? Or you can't even do your finances because you don't know math? You can't, you can't balance an equation? In my mind, again, this is causing, we have a high rate of drug addiction, we have high crime, high poverty, and we're the lowest in education. And it's all revolving around poor education. If you can't read and write, if you can't balance a checkbook, if you can't get a job because you can't even read the, the requirements for a job, you can't even read the job posting, what will you do? You lose hope. When you lose hope, what happens? You turn to crime, you turn to drugs. It, it's sad, you join gangs. And unfortunately, we have one of the highest rates of suicide for teenagers and young adults. That is very, very sad. So why Catholic education? Because we give them hope. Hope for the future. We know there's a reason why to get out of bed. We hold them accountable. We have high expectations because we know they're quite capable. Oh, to have the brain of a teenager again, where it, your brain cells are just growing, they have the ability to learn. They're choosing not to because they're not being held accountable and they don't see the reason. Why do I need to learn this? Because you are a child of God and you have a purpose in life. We don't know what it is right now, but someday you could be a, you could solve cancer. You could, we could be in flying saucers. I don't know. There's so many different things that our kids can do. So many purposes. You could, you were abused as a child then be a psychologist as an adult, counsel those children, help with the homeless, feed the poor. There are so many needs out there in its service. But if you've never been held accountable and you can't find your purpose and you have no hope, it's not going to happen. And that's why Catholic schools, because we give our children hope. We help them to find their purpose. We give them hope, faith, and love to go on. Now, NAEP is a National Association of Educational Progress for the United States. And I did share this in January when it came out. Uh, it is considered one of the most consistent measures of U.S. student achievement over time. Through the NAEP report card, New Mexico is 50th in the nation. But one of the commentators from there said, if Catholic schools were a state, we would be number one in the nation. Because continuously, year after year, we show growth. So my vision is to provide equitable educational opportunities to all children in New Mexico. All children. Now, we have been so blessed with donors from the ACE Scholarship Foundation, from the Daniels Foundation. We have brought hundreds of thousands of dollars to the state of New Mexico to provide tuition assistance to the poor. And we continue to work to serve the poor because they may be poor financially, but not poor in quality, poor in spirit, poor in love, no. They all are children of God and they need to find purpose. They need to find hope. They need to know that they are loved. And that is so important. A child that doesn't feel loved, doesn't perform, gives up. We don't want them to give up. So by bringing our families back to church, which when the child goes to school, they bring their parents back to church. Because guess what? They have to go to Mass. They go to Mass during the week, and they are encouraged to go to Mass on the weekend. But not only that, we bring the parents in, and we evangelize to the parents. We provide Lent during Lent. We have Lenten suppers. 
We do Stations of the Cross during, during Advent. We do Advent seasons. We do different community projects. We do, we feed St. Felix Pantry in Rio Rancho. We help supply needs to Good Shepherd, a homeless shelter, all of us working together to provide and to serve the world around us. So by bringing our children to Catholic schools, we are bringing our parents back to the church, which makes all of our grandparents very happy because they never left. But we need to have, is through our schools, that is an avenue to bring our parents and our families back to church. So we need to allow the parents to be able to make the choice as to where and how their children are educated. And we can only make this happen if we allow the funding to follow the child. Now, last year with the legislative um, session, I was um, on board with one of our uh, senators who wrote a tax credit bill to help provide financial aid to those students that are living in poverty or foster children. So it was to a select group to bring these children into our schools to show them the opportunity that they have in a Catholic school, how to learn. We are not indoctrinating them into the Catholic church. They're all welcome. All children are welcome. We've had Jewish children. We've had all sorts of faiths in our church or some that are non-denominational. And that's okay because they still learn the love of God. Are they forced to take the sacraments? No. That they do, they are expected to go to mass with us during the week. They thrive, they grow, they love it. They learn what it is to be a child of God, to know that respect, to know that care. But how do we make that happen? Because our teachers make 20, depends on the school, between 20 and 50% less than our public school teachers. So I finally raised the salary to 30,000 a year. Many of our teachers in public education are making more than I ever did as a principal in our Catholic schools. But I was rewarded by the love, by to see the progress of the children, to, to build community, because that is your family. Our schools become our family. And so it's pretty amazing. And we're, we're not asking for $30,000 a year. We're just asking to help our poor. How do we do that? There are many funding streams. One of the, you've heard vouchers, nobody, a lot of people don't like vouchers. There's tax credits, that's what we tried before. One of the newest revenues is through, revenue strain, streams is through an ECA, which is an education savings account. Now, when I first brought that up to our, um, some of our House and Senate members last year, I was uh, confronted that no, our poor cannot put money into a savings account. It's like, well, that's not what this is. This is the money that would be set aside by the state for your school district would go into a savings account where you would be able to withdraw it to pay tuition at a school of your choice for tutoring, to buy a computer to help online classes, community college case uh, costs. You could use it for higher education for many different educational expenses. And what you didn't use during elementary and high school could be rolled over to use for college. Again, giving them hope, giving them expectations. I expect you to finish school. I expect you to go to college. Or if it was to go to learn a trade, it would also pay for trade schools. This is one way that would really help our children. Now, we've got 30 states in the United States currently using a school choice, one stream or another. Right now, ESAs are the most popular and the most effective that shows that. And again, when we bring our children into our schools, we give them purpose so that they wanna serve in their communities. By serving in your communities, it could be working at the food pantry, it could be helping at school on the weekend doing a make a difference day. There are so many different choices. It helps our community because these are the kids that are gonna to wanna to get up out of bed as adults to go make a difference. And if we are not doing that, our communities will fail. Right now we are spending millions of dollars 
for people to stay home because they don't want it. They don't see their purpose. They don't know what they want to do. They don't want to work because they see it as a drug. Work is work, but if you have work with a purpose where you're making a difference, it can be a joy. So how can we work together? There's many different ways, but we all need to work together for equitable education opportunities for all of our children. And, and our parents need to be heard. Our legislature needs to actually listen to see this. I know they're crazy busy right now. There's so much going on. But if we could have a voice to say, this is a route to save our state, People are leaving. Have you ever tried to get a doctor's appointment recently? It's a six month waiting period if you're lucky to see a specialist. It's hard because our professionals are leaving. The statistics I read this morning were showing how we have more students leaving the state than coming. So, I mean, if you were given a choice, can I go live, let's say in Florida, they have one of the highest rates of education. They're using ESAs. I can use that money to fund my child. Oh, let's move there and guess and tax credits. So, or do I want to move to New Mexico where they're 50th in the nation for education? The crime rate is high, the poverty is high, and there's a lot of drug and homeless there. So what is the choice? If we work together, we can make New Mexico a much better place. And I think why Catholic education, any faith-based education will help and we can give them hope. The faith of Christ, the love of Christ is what will help us trust in God. You know, we need to have a choice to send our children and our parents to let our parents make that choice to send them to a school where they're not gonna be indoctrinated into the latest social trends. That goes against many of our thoughts. There's, there's a lot of things going on right now that a lot of our parents don't agree with. And yet our teachers and the public schools are being forced to teach. The teachers are leaving the, the program because that's not, in their mind, in many of ours, it's not acceptable. That's not who we want our children to be. So it takes all of us working together. And I do wanna thank you for coming this, this evening and I welcome any feedback because we have to be open to change and we have to be able to see all sides, all sides of the spectrum, to see all children. Most importantly, to see how are we going to make New Mexico, it's one part to make New Mexico a better place because if we can do that, that's a miraculous in itself. But it takes all of us working together to listen to each other, working together, hand in hand. What is the outcome? We want a better future for our children. We want a better future for the children of our children. We wanna bring professionals here. We wanna bring the trades back here. We want it to be the country, the land. The land of enchantment is what we are called. There's other names that we won't go into, but, <laughs> um, but wouldn't it be nice to say the land of hope? And that's going to take all of us working together, bring us back to the love of Christ, bring us back to the church, and bring our children to our schools. So thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. God bless you all. Can you take a couple of questions? I can, yes. Um, I was a hospital chaplain during COVID. I know that the social development of young people was delayed because mm -hmm. of, of um, the procedures for COVID. And with all the mental health issues, as you said, teen suicide, NASA, mm -hmm. how is the archdiocese uh, school system addressing mental health of students and victims? Very good. So we do work with um, mental health. We, um, not all of our schools have the, the funding for a counselor, but through our priests that help, our, every school has a pastor. And through, we have uh, ministries with the archdiocese that can come and help. But it, what is, we have this program called the Circle of Grace. And it was designed to protect our children from abuse. But it has grown into a program 
that teaches the child that you are a child of God and that no one has the right to hurt you emotionally or physically. And it gives you the tools not only to report, but to ask for help. Um, as a principal, there were numerous times that I would have to um, call the hospitals, call parents, and have children placed in mental health facilities in order to get them through this. But they knew, knowing that we are there as a school community to support them and their families. So we do have outreach programs that we use to help support our children and their families during these times of crisis. How much are the teachers in the classrooms connected with um, perhaps even national teacher networks, Catholic teacher networks, things like that, that can support them and offer them kind of continuing education? Is there stuff like that? There is. Um, in fact, the NCEA, which is a National Catholic Educators Association, is very involved. And um, through donations and funding, we are providing um, professional development on a regular basis as a diocese, as an archdiocese. And then every school um, is able to use Title II funding to provide training for teachers um, in all aspects of curriculum, classroom management, behavior, social emotional care, in all those fields. So that's going, that's going well? Right? It is, yes. There's never enough money to do everything we want to do, of course, and that's where our donors come in. They've been very gracious, and the Catholic Foundation has been very helpful. But um, yes, we do have professional development and ongoing development. Yes, thank you. I forget what you said, the EAS program? That's the... Um... Mm -hmm. Educational it's Savings that, Accounts. So, yeah. so who, who funds that? Who, who, where's that money? Who puts the money into that account? So that would come from the state, the um the equitable guarantee that there's a set um, the state has a separate funding stream for money for public school or for schools for education so it would come out of out of there and um, people say well you're stealing our money well actually our schools are saving millions of dollars every year for the state because our children are not receiving any funding from the state to be in our private schools so I mean if you look at it 5,000 students, and the last time I looked, it's over $10,000 a student is what the state gives just to walk in the door. Then with special needs and social emotional training, and you know, if you have any, um, if you're on an education plan, it goes up to 30,000 or more per student. So we're asking if you could give maybe 7,000 a student into a savings account for them to use towards tuition, or books or a computer, whatever, to for the parent to choose. They're paying. I mean, we're all paying taxes. So that money is being paid by the parents that want to send their kids anyways into that fund by their tax, property taxes and state taxes. So yes, the money is coming from the state. From the and that we subsidize to the parents may still have to pay more tuition over above that. That yes, they may. But depending on you see, yeah, but so, okay. And some of our non-Christian schools are 10, 20, or more thousand a year. Our Catholic schools, because we are called to serve, we keep it as low as possible um, and at the same time still have a living wage for our teachers. It is a challenge, but we are taught, you know, that's what we're taught, to serve and how to make it work. I like the idea of the... Um... You talk about a community, we all have to work together, listen to one another, work together. I think that's certainly true of the Archdiocese, that we all of us have to recognize the priority that Catholic education is. It's a, it's a gospel mandate, really. Um, it's an evangelization tool. It's a, it's a tool to help people out of poverty. We know that's the story of the United States. So the whole Archdiocese uh, could involve itself in supporting that a similar kind of a fund, perhaps, you know, where, and I know I've talked to parents and grandparents who no longer have children in school or who live in an area of the archdiocese where they're just, they're not having the schools, Catholic schools nearby, but they're still dedicated to Catholic schools. And so they, for example, I know some people will pay the tuition of a, of a child or put money up for that child for the whole year or because they're so dedicated to the cause of Catholic schools. So I think that's an important point, that whole communal aspect of it, we all have to pitch in this is, to make this successful. 
Right, and some of our schools are an area where the population has become more aged. So, and not only that, you know, you might have grandparents living there, but the the value of the house has gotten so so high that our young families can't afford to move there. So their demographics have gone down. But like I tell the the grandparents, you know, give your inheritance now to your child. Don't wait till you die. They don't. They won't need it then. Share it now because the best gift you can give is education. And so that we have some grandparents that are doing that. And then sometimes we have, you know, single parents or somebody with no children. I said, sponsor a child, even if it's $100 a month, that will help them to buy groceries for a few days and, you know, just to help them with tuition assistance. And we have um, the Catholic Foundation has taken, has had many donors that have helped to fund that and we get disbursements through that, but it's not enough to keep our families uh especially our families in need to bring them there you know i've lived when i was in florida the public school bus would come by and get the public school kids and then they come back around and get the the private school kids and take them to their school because transportation is huge and as we're meeting here at the norbertine abbey the south valley used to have many catholic schools but because of the poverty it, they closed there are no Catholic schools in the South Valley. And that's very, very sad. Mm. And these are the children that need it more than anyone else to have, to be in a school where they're cared for and loved and where they can grow and flourish and become well-educated. Um, but getting them, even if I had money to say, here's, I'll give you free tuition, they can't get their transportation is a problem. So that's, that's another issue. But one thing at a time, um, mm. And I, that would be nice if we got ESAs, educational savings account, and that would provide transportation. That would be huge. Yes. Well, I, I remember when we were designing the, uh, you know, what the title to the lecture series was, was going to be, and, you, and that the, the, the draft had floated, you know, with her, you know, Catholic education. And and I think actually, I think it was you, you have raised, you know, when you're sort of exchanging about that, you were saying, you know, that, that the title itself sort of implies kind of, you know, there's kind of a negative connotation in terms of, is it, you know, is it relevant, you know, where is it going, we don't really know where it's going, uh, you know, that, that there's, there was a sense of uncertainty to, to that title. And which is true, you know, and that that was kind of sort of built into the conversation. And, and I think one of the things that at least implicitly you're, you're answering uh, in, in terms of talking about not just statistically where Catholic education is succeeding, that we, we can see the numbers for themselves and also where public education in many respects right now in New Mexico, but also nationally is not succeeding. The other issue, of course, the drill down in terms of where Catholic education is going and why it's important, you know, is what you've touched on at certain points during, during the, the talk, and that is this notion of values, you know, and, and talking about you know, sort of a, you know, a community spirit, a spirit of core, if you will. And so, but then, then to play devil's advocate, and because this, of course, is going to be the pushback. You know, I, I've spent most of my educational career teaching in public higher education, you know, state-funded universities. I think that with the exception of one course I team taught for the MTS program here to St. Edward College, everything I've done has been for, you know, a public secular institution, right? And, and so I'm very steeped in that culture, you know, both for, I'd say, good and for ill. And one of the things that I, I, could, I could envision, or I, or I'm certain would be pushback, would be uh, that folks would say, now we have the, you know, a lot of emphasis on this, you know, the DEIB, the diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, you know, you know, everybody is welcome, you know, we want to make sure everybody feels safe, you know, so on and so forth. And, and, and that's certainly well and good. But the you know the, the specific you know charge that might be leveled against Catholic schools, uh, especially you know not so much I say you know you know universities and colleges, but definitely you know uh, you know K through twelve is that you know as part of deploying Catholic values as part of the educational mission of Catholic schools, is is there going to be at some level built into that you know sort of a value system that is perhaps not inclusive or that is exclusive? You know, and of course, you know, we would, we would hear, uh, you know, perhaps criticism that, you know, is our, ultimately our children being indoctrinated in 
in, you know, in thought and in, in sort of belt on shown, you know, outlooks and, and politics and ideology and so forth that perhaps, you know, are, are you know, not supportive of equal rights for women, you know, or perhaps not friendly to the LGBTQ community. And so that, you know, essentially when you know, children were coming out, they're going and going into higher ed or into their, to their jobs, but then, you know, that they have uh, a worldview shaped by, you know, you know, a church, you know, that does not in some respects, you know, honest, honestly share all of the values of secular culture in the United States or the Western world or, or, or so forth. And so that there might be, or you know, people that are you know atheists, you know, saying, well, why, why would you want to send a, a, a son or a daughter to a school that, you know, uh, is, is teaching this fantasy that that God is involved in anything when we all know that there is no God, you know, that that's all just something that people concoct, you know, and uh, it's sort of kind of a Marxian argument, so to speak. And so if the question would be is that if, if you're drilling down into this idea that there is a public benefit, that there is a general benefit to Catholic education, and somebody is then making this, this you know, sort of counter push to say, yeah, but you know, what you're ultimately forming children for, forming these young minds for, is not compatible with the value system of progressive Western culture, how would you respond to that? <clears throat> That's a very good question and one that has been uh, very controversial over the last few years. Um, so I would say, and this is personal, this is not speaking as the archdiocese, this is speaking myself, that we are educating the child and that the child is a child of God and that we are giving them the tools that they need to make these decisions for themselves. Right now, society is making these decisions and forcing children to make these choices, whether they like it or not, because maybe they don't feel like they belong. Maybe they feel, you know, I want to be cool. I'm not in the in-group. I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to change my, my gender. I'm going to change my pronouns because they want to fit. Is that something they really want to do or is it something society is pushing on them to do? And so what we in our schools teach is that you are a child of God and God, and God has given you free will to make these choices, but you need to have an open mind and let's first grow up to be that person God wants you to be. And if that is a choice as an adult, then that is your right to make that as an adult. As a child, let's keep our mind open and listen to what the voice of God is telling us. Where do we need to be? Who do we need to be? And we love those children. And if we have families, I've had families of same-sex parents, and I'm here to, to work with the child. I love the child. And you know, often I love the parents too. They are children of God, and this is what they have chosen. It is not something I would have chosen, but you know, understand that is a rough life for them as well. And we are not here called to condemn others. We are here to nurture them, to help them, to put them, to help them find their path in life. And if that is the path that they have chosen, then so be it. It is not my job to condemn. It is my job to help, to guide, and to love. And that is what God calls us to do. And that's why we need Catholic education. And that's why we need Catholic education, because I think that there is a lot of false and misperceptions out there that we are there judging people. It's like, you know, when we go to church, it what a, you know, things have changed and people are not perceiving church as church. When we go there and we ask, you know, I confess to Almighty God that I have sinned through my thoughts and through my words, what I have done, what I have failed to do. And I ask Blessed Mary and, and all the angels and saints and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God, because I need your help. And I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for you. You know, none of us are saints. All of us make mistakes. We're all sinners. You know, Romans 8 tells us that we are slaves to sin. Temptation is around every corner. But if we come to church and pray together to support one another, that is what church is about. Coming to celebrate the love of Christ, to be fed in the Eucharist, but to support one another. Whether they're old, whether they're young, whether it's a single mom, a gay couple, 
to support and to love everyone and to help to be that light of Christ. That is what we are called to do. It's a challenge. And, and sometimes, but there is a big misperception. And I think people have left the church because they think that we're just a bunch of hypocrites. It's like, well, actually, you're the one that's judging us. That is not the intent at all. We are humans struggling just like everyone else. We're all struggling to get through this world. Did you have a question? Yes, I do. So I'm um, wondering um, how relevant are uh, Catholic priests and religious in the Catholic art schools? So from experience in you know, the teaching in the Jamaican school, uh, here we, we had like over a thousand students. Well, it's a secular school, not a Catholic school. And um, just one teenager, I think, from the Methodist and the Anglican Church was working as the counselor, even though at some point he can step in, you know, um, as a seminar. So um, here in the States, um, is there a limitation? Um, are there some priests assigned to some schools, though not permanently, but who can always come in to you know, work as you know, counselors? Mm -hmm. And also, if they can, uh, they train you know, to use the you know, counseling principles for these students, because I think one of the challenges could be um, like um, communication. Sometimes they don't need to be a professional counselor, but they need you know, the priestly um, or religious figure. You know, someone they can confide in and speak to. Actually, from my experience, I noticed that you know, several students we have, you know, coming towards me because they are calling me father, but I am not a clergy. Um, but as someone preparing to become a priest, they were able to confide in me. But um, I also felt you know, there's a barrier. I came to teach social studies and not you know to be a counselor. So is that a some um case um scenario here in this? We would love to have you come into our schools. In fact, having vocations in the school as a counselor, as a guidance, as a teacher, what better way to evangelize to our children? You know, I would. I think that is awesome. We have had um, some other brothers from here come and teach, and some of them have come in and, and even as substitutes. But having religious in our schools is a huge tool to evangelize and to show our kids that, guess what? And share your story. I mean, many of the priests that I know have said, well, I used to do this, and then God called me to be a priest. Or I used to do this. We have a friend when we were living in Germany who was a radio announcer, and he became a priest, and he was very outgoing. But there are, like you said, the spiritual advisors that we have in our priestly, you know, the men that can come and be counselors or advise our children to show, to explain to them or someone that, like you said, the kids would confide, confide in you. It's nice to have someone that they can share their, you know, their desperate situations or their dreams, whatever it could be, or what would you do in this case? Um, they need a, an adult that they can talk to, that they can trust. So I think that's a wonderful idea. And I think we need more of that. We need to bring, we have their archbishop here with us this evening and he assigns the priest to the schools and that's gotta be such a tough job to do. Um, we are very blessed to have priests to be the pastors of our school. And we pray for more, and we pray for more schools too. We pray for more priests, for more vocations because you are or the representative of Christ on earth. And when we see our religious, it gives us hope, but it's like, I mean, when I was a kid and I saw the nuns, it's like, my group, I want to be a nun. But it didn't happen. God had another plan. But thank you. That's that's a very good idea. Very good. Any, yes. You know, just as you know, as a, as a comment, I, I I think one of the, the things that I've come to experience over the last few years you know, functioning both as, you know, you know, an assisting priest, you know, in, in parishes for, for liturgies and so forth, um, but also then, you know, teaching, you know, first at, at you know, CNM and now at UNM, uh, I've been able to sort of have both, you know, the sort of binocular vision, you know, two optics, you know, in terms of looking at, you know, you know the world of, you know, the teaching function of the Catholic Church and, you know, and its role as, as you know, kind of a social, you know, uh, adhesive, you know, and then, 
and then also, you know, in the educational mission and public, you know, higher education, of course, most of those students are coming from Albuquerque public schools and so forth, uh, or, you know, schools in New Mexico. And the thing that I find interesting is, is sort of as a predicate to your, your, your comment in terms of this is, you know, how you would answer some of these questions that people that might be critical of why is Catholic, you know, education relevant in 2023, you know, and important and, and does it you know, inculcate values that are universal values versus you know, exclusive values, that kind of thing, uh, or intolerance is that I find now, you know, and it's definitely gotten worse that I, I am more at ease in a, a church or a parochial function, uh, you know, talking sometimes off the cuff, uh, than I am now getting in front of a classroom you know, in a public university or public college in terms of the sense that, you know, something I said could be misinterpreted or, or condemned, or I could get uh, called on the carpet for, you know, some sort of indiscretion in terms of, you know, saying something that was offensive and so forth. Whereas I think, you know, the, the you know, the, the stereotype would be is that, you know, the Catholic church, you know, is, is much more locked down and restrictive in terms of, you know, you know, this is right and this is wrong. You can talk about this and you can't talk about that and so forth. And I find that there seems to be now a complete shift, you know, that, you know, that there, there's a, there's both a kind of a, almost kind of a police state mentality and a conformism in the academy, the public academy now that is much more rigid than what I find, you know, at least in, in this particular diocese, you know, encountering, you know, talking with Catholics and other clergy and, and, and giving homilies and so forth, you know, and so I think, you know, the, I don't know if I would call that ironic or tragic, but, you know, it's been my experience and I've noticed that much more in the last few years and that, so, you know, the, for the people on the other side, not to play devil's advocate anymore, but to, to, to as a proponent of Catholic education, I find that there's much more of an inculcation of intellectual freedom now within a Catholic context, within the Catholic intellectual tradition and in, in many quadrants of, of the public academy. I think it's because I would say respect. I think that in our church, we have learned to respect the opinions of others. It does not have to be so divisive. The political world and the secular world right now is very divisive. And in our church, we are trying to pull it together to, to hear, not only to hear with our ears, but to hear with our mind and our heart. You know, because I think ultimately we have the same goal in mind. Why are we fighting over how to get there? If, if we have this goal of educating our children, of equity, of bringing them out of poverty, of helping with mental health, why do we spend so much time and money and get nowhere because no one is willing to listen. And I hope and pray that in our church, and it does appear that way, that we are not only listening, but respecting. And that's huge. You know, and that's what we are called to do. You know, when you look at Jesus and he would go out and, you know, evangelize, not to the wealthy, not to the most highly educated, he went to the fishermen. He went to the woman at the well, you know, to people that would listen. And, and in one of the readings this week, I think it was yesterday, that if you're in this town and they're not listening, shake your shoes off and keep moving on. Go to somewhere where they will listen. And that's what we're called, to listen to one another, to respect and work together. And that's, I mean, that's the church that we're at. We need to bring people back where they are willing to listen and work together to love God, to share that love, and to serve our community. And I think that's what our schools are doing. And, you know, there's different schools for different needs. We have schools that have robotics. We have schools that have dual language. We have a school that has special needs. We have our East Mountain School that is a classical. They teach the Socratic way, and we... No, no two humans are alike. So our schools are there for you to make a choice. A choice where you think your child will grow and thrive to be the child that God wants them to be. And that's why we need our Catholic education. And I am just astounded that our schools are not full. I think it's the best kept secret in New Mexico. 
I, I don't understand why they're not full when I see so much tragedy out there in our world. This is a place where our kids need to be. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any concluding uh, comments or remarks? This was excellent. Yeah, this was. Thank you. So thank much. you very much, uh, ma'am. I appreciate you coming out um, to whoever might be watching and is watching. Um, you know, we have two more of these before the symposium. We have Father Matthew Doherty, my my Nambisha classmate, actually, who recently got his his PhD from uh, Yale University in marine biology, and I was teaching as an assistant professor at St. Edward College. So he will be delivering a, a lecture on probably his experience of uh, teaching uh, at, a, at a Catholic college, at St. Edward College, and how his work and research in, in marine biology uh, you know, interfaces with his faith and also his, his, his role as, as a priest, as an orbitine priest. And then in February, we will have another uh, person I studied with at, at CTU um, that uh, received his D-min from CTU uh, a few years uh, back, uh, Brother Ernest Miller, who is a De La Salle a Christian brother who has worked in education his whole life, was formerly the, the vice president for mission and heritage at uh, De La Salle University in, in uh, Philadelphia. And so he will also be giving a presentation. And of course, in April, we have our concluding symposium. And so I would encourage uh, all of you, uh, if you enjoyed uh, the program this evening, uh, if you're watching or if you were here live, uh, uh, tell a friend. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about important things here at this Abbey. And, and this is, I want to build this lecture series, um, hopefully uh, in, you know, for years to come, whether it be Catholic education or other important issues that, the educational mission of the church is, is very much not just to think about uh, you know, the normatine charism, though education is very much a part of our heritage, but I think it's, it's part of our, our sort of joint mission as, as a church, you know, to offer, you know, edifying, uh, uh, you know, events in, in education, you know, for, for the faithful and you know, for people at large. Um, so again, thank you all for coming out. I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Father Stephen. I'm the director of the Norbertine Library. So if you're wondering who is this guy in white, that's who I am. Um, uh, always welcome at the Abbey, and we hope to see you again for for the uh, Father Matthews uh, uh, lecture on, on uh, the 8th of November. So have a good evening. Thank you. God bless. Mm -hmm.